this is an interesting topic, and, and, and I'm sure it's of, well, I hope it's of direct interest to, to, to all of you. There's been lots of talk about um, new, uh, the new anti-protest laws, and, and they're not, a, they're, they're, there is one, and it's very draconian, but it's not as far reaching as many people uh, might imagine. The only actual change they've made, bad enough as it is, is an amendment to the Roads Act. It's not the anti-protest law, it's the daggy old Roads Act. And they inserted uh, section 14G, which took uh, the offence of blocking traffic, there's always been a blocking traffic uh, offence, which would get you probably a $500 fine and, and maybe a good behaviour bond, but it was basically a fine. Uh, and they took that, what would be a fine, and they made it two years uh, jail. Just, just on mad, insane, insane impulse. You know, who can be tougher? We can be tougher. Oh, well, we'll be tougher. You know, this, this thing just cruised through the upper house, late night city, two years jail. And it's almost undecipherable as to what the hell it means. Uh, uh, it, it, it literally just says, if you obstruct traffic. So, if you're old and you're on a walking frame, are you, are you obstructing traffic? Yes, you are, right? Obviously. So, uh, it's shocking legislation. But the good news is, and I thought I'd start with some good news, we are kicking their asses on this charge, right? Like, absolutely kicking their asses, right? I don't think we've lost one. I oh, know we have, sorry, we've, we've lost one. We lost, we lost two, we lost two. But out of about, you know, 20, 20, Seven. 27. So it's not all doom and gloom, but that legislation is truly a piece of shit and it should be discarded. It's uh, uh, really draconian, incredibly unnecessary, and even the police wince uh, when they talk about it to you. Because I went on down the courts, I see the police, the police prosecutors, they're all saying, oh my God, what am I going to do here? But the police are quite good or experienced at dealing with protesters, and they've got loads of powers already, and they know it. You know, they don't need this shit. Uh, uh, and, 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 and because they've sort of atomised it, weaponised it, I think what will actually happen is there'll be a reluctance to use it. You know, they know if it's a, if, if it's a ridiculous uh, example, they won't use it. I, I don't think, I'm now quite convinced they were being, being so roundly uh, in that we put through 18 uh, just a month or so ago uh, after well, close on a year of these people being on these shocking bail conditions. All of them hit the dust. All of them hit the dust. And, and they know it. And, and I don't think you'll see that again in an ordinary street protest. What you will see, they'll apply it to uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. They'll apply it to the tunnel. But I think that's about it. So keep away from those two icons and you'll probably be okay. But the, but the more significant, the, it's more significant actually what's happened than I'm, I'm absolutely standing in the worst spot, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, uh, what's actually more significant is not the application of uh, new laws, it's the application of some very ancient laws. The old railway laws of New South Wales. So what? Well, not that far back, but the steam age. What they've done is, you, you, you see, you go through the list of what people have been charged with in the last uh, year. Huge numbers of them are charged with railway offences, which because the railways were the airlines and the uh, you know airfields of the 19th century, and, and people were terrified about people derailing trains full of passengers. You know, Ned Kelly did it. I suppose it was real, you know. So you'll see these extraordinarily high uh, uh, penalties on railway offences. I was scratching my head for so long. Well, the railway offences are like 10 years jail or something. Uh, because they were designed for people who might dare lay, you know, logs across a, a train track. Okay, of course, you should have a high penalty for that. It, it wasn't designed for protesters who step across a railway line, right? Which is ultimately how it came to be applied instead of the ordinary laws they have there. So uh, uh, an experienced crowd of protesters, if, if any of you have ever copped a charge before, it's likely to have been um, a failure to follow a, a move-on order. It's the simplest, and the police know that this is ridiculous. There's all this stuff that's coming from the, it really is coming from the political class. It's not the police, please, they know how to. Yeah, get out. I'll give you a move on order, blah, blah, blah. 
you don't move. Okay, well now I arrest you. That's what else do you want? What else do you want? You know, move on or I arrest you. Okay, I arrest you. It was that resistance in your elbow? Okay, let's resist police. And if they really hate you, I think, oh, he clipped my, uh, he clipped my shoulder with his arm. Let's assault police. So you've got loads of powers already. You don't need to use that. But so what happened since uh, my, I'll just sort of, Lily will pick up on this, I'm sure, because we're, we're, sort of, we're, we're shadowing each other to some degree. The story that begins in November 21, end of 21, and it goes through to basically the middle of last year, and that was a very high um, uh, period of protest, blockade Australia mostly, a few others, uh, and the political response to it, and it is a political response because it was came under a, a police uh, task force or strike force. Now, these are special units that are created by the minister. They're not, they're not uh, emerging from some police need or what the police are asking for. They're very much a, a, a strategy, a, a strategized unit that is drawn from all um, elements of the police and it is hypercharged with powers. So either ex, sort of extra powers of arrest, if you like, but really what it has is massive resources. They can call in anything. Any number of people around the clock, every resource, they are constantly walking into the court to get warrants, surveillance warrants. They have helicopters, dogs, undercover, uh, a full street surveillance team. So a lot of people were being picked up on these, you know, on these bail breaches. And it's it like some guy in a baseball cap. I mean, that, that is massively expensive to follow people. And what's happening with the BA people in, in that week in Sydney? They'd be at home or travelling in Newtown or something. Someone's behind them, right? They thought they were paranoid. Uh, uh, you know, and that barely happens anymore, that sort of stuff. So anyway, so they, they, in November in Newcastle, they implemented, and I think it was announced the day after the Newcastle process, uh, protest began, a Strike Force Guard. And what Strike Force Guard did, and that's why I think this is more significant than focusing on the new laws, Strike Force Guard went through the old uh, uh, legislation and looked for the most severe thing they could get because here were people you know, coming into a coal yard, crossing a railway line to go into the coal yard and, and, so, and the, the typical sort of charge you'd get for that is entering closed lands which is like a, like a trespass uh, and it's pretty insignificant, you know, you, you'll, get a, you'll get a fine or a bond. So clearly it's, it's either, you know, uh, radio stations or ministers saying, I want these people crunched. And, and no, sh no, no shortage of ministers said exactly that, throw the book at them. Well, the police did. And they went through the old, old legislation and they dredged up uh, the railway, the railway offences. I was just taking note of them there. I, I would have had it perfectly prepared if I had my notes. Um, yeah, so... Uh, the, the railway offences are up to 10 years jail, 7 years jail, 10 years jail. The other one that's a, a massive one is interfere with mining equipment. That's 7 years jail. Now on the face of it, it sounds like that's, you know, you want a law so people don't interfere with mining equipment. Well you do because there'll be people working underground and someone shuts off the air vent, you know, so you've got to have a fairly serious offence. But almost, I can't think of one that was actually interfering with mining equipment. There was no mining equipment. <laughs> so they're going down to a port, they're trying to stop coal uh, loaders. Is that mining equipment? I don't think it is. Um, they were walking along disused railway lines and getting either the railway offence of entering a railway line or in that, the best one was endangering life on a railway line. And, and you can imagine when they wrote that legislation, they were doing something really serious, endangering life on a railway line. Well, it turned out for most of them, it was endangering their own life, apparently. They were on the railway line, therefore they are endangering your life, therefore it's eight, eight years jail. So we saw that first wave in Newcastle, and that was the first in, uh, uh, imprisonment of um, uh, Eric Herbert. Everyone else, even people that had, had done minimal things other than hold a sign and stepped into the vague area of the port or something, but not the ones who were hanging off the cranes and stuff. Everyone got a CCO, which is a very, very high, uh, 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 good behaviour bond in a way, but if you breach it, it has very significant consequences. 
they scale them in New South Wales. ICO, you breach an ICO, 90% sure you're going to go to jail. CCO, you're at risk of going to jail. Uh, CRO, no jail, but then, then they, they scale down. They all have CCOs, which is very, very um, serious. In Newcastle Court, which had just imprisoned um, Eric Herbert. I'll tell you Eric's story very briefly. Eric uh, got on top of a, 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 tra a train, uh, on top of a train, a, a loader, a stationary loader, so he's not, he's not jumping in front of the moving trains, and there's no train hurtling down the track anymore. It's stationary. He gets on top. I think he'd lose himself, or he might have um, bolted himself, so it did something like that. They come and get him. And, and he gets a type of endangered life uh, offence. He would normally get in close land, failure to move on, right? But the police come down. They could have done that. Hey, Bozo, get off the train, mate. Come on, you're on a run. Okay, bring him in. Take him off, take him to the station, right? That's what you'd normally get. And then he'd resist and then he'd get that. So he walks into Newcastle local court, an experienced protester, and he knows that the court's rather like honesty and candour. And so what he normally does is he walks in and he goes, I'm guilty, you're right? I did it, yes, I did do it. I did march, you know, uh, across that road and I did it and I'm proud of it, but I'm here to get my you know, penalty. Well, in his case, <laughs> the penalty was 12 months jail, uh, uh, following another little, another breach. He did two in a week, right? The following breach, got two in a week, 12 months jail. And so we got him out, well, I think Legal Aid actually got him out, which I was very grateful for, was it Legal Aid? Thank you. Uh, got him out bail. We lodged a, um, an appeal for him and it only concluded, so this was, June, uh, no, sorry, November uh, 21, he's sent to prison. Young guy, sent to prison. He gets out, we, we fought, lodged the appeal. It takes us until uh, five weeks ago to conclude it, and he walked free. Like, so so I, 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 I'm going on too long, but I'll just get, I'll say this. Of all the people that, have, that were arrested in Newcastle, the ones we acted for, there might have been some others, 17 of them got CCOs, high, very high, uh, good behaviour. We appealed every one of them, and this is really significant, and, and the, the local courts are all noticing this. We took 17 convictions, CCO, walked into the district court in uh, Newcastle and ran a fairly sophisticated uh, legal case about comparing it, you know, apples for oranges and lots of penalties and blah, blah, blah. 16 of the 17 walked out no conviction. So they took it from a CCO to a no conviction and a big up yours to the Newcastle local court, right? So it's really fun when you can get up into a higher court. So the higher court's been really good to us. They knocked out 16 of 17 um, on that. And Eric went from 12 months jail to ultimately concluding just a few weeks ago, walked out no penalty. We entered a guilty plea because uh, 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 he had already entered a guilty plea. So, yeah, and, and the level of no penalty, so he's guilty. He said, I'm guilty. I'm right, right, right. That's not okay. All right. No penalty. No, not a dollar fine. Not a single day of good behavior. Nothing. Go on, on your way. But it's a huge insult, right? Uh, the same thing happened when we had two Max Kearney and uh, Andrew George. Both sent to jail. One dead run onto a rugby field. And, and, and instead of charging him with enclosed lands, oh, he gets explosive devices and they just keep digging into the explosive device. There was no explosive device, right? That's just absurd. Max uh, climbed onto a, uh, at Port Botany, climbed onto a, um, a crane. A crane. Um, it was pretty extreme, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, heart was in my uh, mouth that day. Like. <laughs> but that offence didn't carry the biggest penalty. The biggest penalty was that he crossed a railway line. And, and it was a disused railway line. No, no trains on it, right? No trains on it. But they added in danger of life in a railway line. And that was one thing. They sent him to jail. But again, he, unfortunately for him, he was in jail for six weeks. Get to the district court. Oh, go home. Andrew George, four months, gets the district court, go home. So it's not a miserable, it's, it's a battle, and it's, it's absolutely politicised because you don't get task forces and strike forces unless it's coming from uh, the government. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a controversial statement to say that. Uh, but at the moment, the higher courts are being fantastic. Right? The lower courts 
are far more uh, privy or sensitive to the Daily Telegraph and the 2GB and everyone calling them, you know, slap on the wrist sort of stuff. Uh, they, they went a little bit loopy, I thought, for a while, but I think it's over. Well, I hope it's over. Okay. That's my summary. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to the organisers for putting this event on, not just tonight, but every other month for like literally decades, so well done. <laughs> um, before I begin in earnest, I'd like to acknowledge that we're here today on the stolen land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing resistance to colonial occupation, and the ongoing violence that is used to repress that resistance. I'm going to talk today about the police, about the courts, and about the carceral system. And while I think the things that I'm going to talk about are quite serious and they do deserve attention, I just want to acknowledge at the outset as well that these are not the most violent, the most vile, or the most common injustices perpetrated by those systems. I want to acknowledge that the cycles of trauma and violence that are perpetuated and driven by those systems disproportionately affect First Nations folks, other communities of colour, gender non-conforming people, and the poor. Um, mechanisms of control are always tested on a society's most marginalised before they're generalised throughout the system. And I think it's important we remember that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm going to speak tonight from my perspective and speak to things that I've either experienced or borne direct witness to. But there is a lot to say about life in the carceral colony that I won't touch on at all because I'm not the right person to speak to you about those things. When you find the right person to speak to you about those things, listen. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that I come to you as a humble activist standing on the shoulders of giants. I learnt everything I know about organising uh, from other organisers whose mistakes were transformed into wisdom by the act of recounting them to me. <laughs> I hope to do the same <laughs> tonight. Now, political repression, if it's done well, has many arms. There are many pillars that hold up the prevailing power structures, right? The most relevant, in my view, are the, to this issue are the police, the media, the courts, and the parliament in that order. Um, I'd like to explore, like, I'm going to use my time to basically explore how each of those sets of institutions is participating in political repression right now, and then offer some suggestions for sort of how we can counteract those effects. So, um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to introduce you to a concept that's called strategic incapacitation. Strategic incapacitation is a set of policing practices that were developed for use against organised crime networks. Um, the aim of strategic incapacitation isn't really to arrest and charge any person in particular. It's not even really to prevent any crime in particular. It is to incapacitate the network of people undertaking the alleged crimes. So you can see where that's going already, <laughs> right? Recently, I learned that a policing and intelligence conference took place in late 2022, and it was called the National Forum on Managing Organised Disruptive Activity. How ominous is that? Uh, it was attended by law enforcement from across all jurisdictions of Australia and New Zealand. Um, but the shift that we as activists have experienced in the way that we are being policed obviously goes back way further than that. Um, Mark touched on, you know, the first person in my personal circles to be given a custodial sentence was Eric Herbert, and that happened in November 2021. The New South Wales anti-protest laws passed in April 2022, and this conference, this national forum, happened in, like, August or September of that year. So by the time the conference happens, Trump Force God had existed for, like, six or seven months. Um, so given that timing, it is not inconceivable to me that Strike Force Guard sort of represented an experiment in strategic incapacitation, and then the results of that experiment were communicated to the rest of law enforcement, like the broader law enforcement community at that conference, testing it on the rat bags before you generalise it throughout the system, right? Um, in October of that same year, so like a couple months after that conference, IMARC, the International Mining and Resources Conference, came to Sydney for the first time. 
Previously, it had been in Melbourne, a city that has a long and proud history of disrupting that conference. I do not believe that it would have been lost on the organisers of IMAR that months earlier, New South Wales had passed some of the most repressive anti-protest legislation in the country. And then they moved it here. So <clears throat> Sydney, by contrast, does not have a long and proud tradition of disrupting IMAR, so it sort of caught us off guard. And then conversations were had and it was sort of decided that we weren't going to do anything wild, we were just going to have a straight up and down, normal rally, submit a form one, have the cops, you know, approve it, whatever, because that was all anyone had capacity to throw together. Despite, so just, that is to say, no civil disobedience and no protest outside of the law was in fact being planned for this conference. However, at least, 44 people across four jurisdictions were had like interactions with police that were like under the pretense of investigating IMARC before it had happened. Um, some of those people were the same people that were arrested in the Blockade Australia protests and they were still on bail, so it provided police a reason to check on them. Some of those people had absolutely nothing to do with Blockade Australia or Blockade IMARC. Um, I had nothing to connect me to Blockade Australia from the police's perspective other than the fact that I picked someone up from Silverwater when they were released from custody in the aftermath of the Cola raid. Um, my partner, so, and then I was subsequently questioned in my home uh, about IMA before it happened. My partner, who was driving a different vehicle that was registered in my that happens to be registered in my name, was pulled over on his way to work and questioned about IMARC before it had happened. Um, when we were driving to the action on the day, we were pulled over on the way in and detained in the car and questioned in the car for a while. All of that for an action that was completely lawful. No civil disobedience element to that action. This is fully consistent with the principles of strategic incapacitation. So it's not about the action, it's about the network that sustains the action. That's the only reason that you go after someone whose only connection to the alleged crime is picking someone up from the cop shop. They don't just want to know who's doing these so-called crimes, they want to know who feeds them, who houses them when they need somewhere to stay, who picks them up when they need a lift, who's rocking up with a sandwich when they get released from custody. And <clears throat> that's like basically all of the work that goes on around direct action that is integral to sustaining it, but doesn't involve doing anything unlawful yourself. And that's the, the, the thing that I really want to emphasize on this point is that, you know, previously it was like, okay, and, then, and this is where, you know, I, I'm agreeing with Mark that the task force is a more significant sort of development than the actual anti-protest legislation. Um, it is a meaningful shift towards authoritarianism proper if the objective of police goes from stopping activists from offending to breaking the climate movement, right? If it's about strategic incapacitation, the network is the movement in our case. So that's a different thing altogether. The last thing I want to mention before I move on from the police is the issue of bail as a mechanism of control. So Anti-protest legislation is indeed a problem in its own right, and it's also an easy thing to rally around. If you've got the message like, this law is bad, we need to repeal it, that's a quick, easy thing to communicate. It's not very complicated messaging. Um, however, so to date, as Mark mentioned, uh, everyone who's been charged with the now infamous Section 144G charge that Mark was speaking about has had the charge withdrawn pretty much before they've ever made it to trial because the cops don't want to actually have it tested. They just want to scare you with it and then withdraw it. So uh, most recently, I believe that happened to Brad Homewood um, and his th that charge was withdrawn like on the morning of his court appearance when he turned up. And the thing is, by that time, it had already done its job. So by that time, Brad had been on bail for over a year, subjected to bail conditions that prevented him from communicating with a list of over 30 other activists, 
prevented from using end-to-end -end encrypted platforms, which is where most digital organizing happens, prevented from traveling interstate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The combined effect of those conditions took him out of organizing for more than a year. And you can only get away with imposing bail conditions that severe when you're charged with an offense that carries jail time as part of its maximum penalty. So the effect, if not the intention, of the anti-protest legislation is it has provided police with a, a quote-unquote serious charge to charge us with to justify these intense like bail conditions. Um, and then it doesn't even actually matter whether the charge sticks in court because in the meantime it's allowed you to control that person and prevent them from participating in protests at all, even protests that are completely lawful. And if that's not being strategically incapacitated, I don't know what is. Um, then when you finally get up, then what they do is the police drag the court process out and they adjourn it and they adjourn it and they adjourn it to keep you in that on bail for as long as you possibly can be. And then you get off them finally. If you haven't been burnt off the whole thing by that experience, then you go back out, you get charged with some bullshit you didn't do, and you're straight back on that. So you, they keep us in the cycle of, of being under these, like, these, it's literally called conditional liberty. Now, to the media. <laughs> Grassroots protests, unless they are unprecedentedly large, rarely receive media coverage at all. And when we do get coverage, it's usually unfavorable, unless it's in like The Guardian or something where they're like, ooh, maybe they have a point. Oh, maybe not. Oh, no, no, you're right, you're right. Fuck them. <laughs> um, so there are two rhetorical devices that are being extremely successful, and I like, I legit hear them come out of people's mouths word for word without the person realizing where they got it from. The first one is the conflation of inconvenience with violence. If a protest disrupts something, especially something that makes somebody a lot of money, it is spoken about as violence. So you will often see someone saying on the news, well, we respect the right to protest peacefully, but these extremists are inconveniencing everyday people. <laughs> so the construction is, if you are disobedient or inconvenient, you are no longer peaceful, ergo you are violent, right? And then that creates space for the police and the courts to treat us however they like, and for the parliament to legislate against us without experiencing any kind of public backlash. So it undermines any sympathy that, I, that like activists might have received from people who don't themselves protest regularly, but like care about democracy in general. The other... Uh, yeah, and it, it also serves to, or I think it's a deliberate attempt to divide the movement into the right kind and the wrong kind of protester, which again is undermining the network, which is the goal of strategic incapacitation. The other rhetorical device that is really, really successful is the infantilization of activists as people, right? It's a classic ad hominem strategy. If you can't attack what they say, make it about who they are. This is the second iteration of this strategy that I've witnessed in my brief organizing career. The previous one was that we were terrorists. Remember that phase? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So boring. <laughs> yeah, so boring. <laughs> that was what they used to call us when they wanted to undermine us, and that played pretty well with some demographics, and those people will still say it, but in the general public, it didn't really catch on because it was just a bit hysterical. Like, everyone was like, calm down. Um, so they switched it up and we went from being scary, dangerous, powerful terrorists to whinging, petulant children, right? And that does two, two important things at once. Um, the first is, like, again, it's undermining that sympathy. And the second one is it diminishes protest itself from a legitimate and necessary form of politi political participation to essentially a public tantrum, right? So it takes all, it disconnects protest from power, it disconnects it from the issue that it was even speaking to, and just makes it like an annoying, like self-indulgent performance. Um, that's, uh, it transforms an active citizen into an angsty teenager, and it transforms civic participation into essentially a very elaborate role-playing game. Perhaps most importantly, it works to destroy the notion that there's a damn thing you can do about it. 
Now to uh, one of my all-time favorite role-playing games, which is the court. Um, the whole idea of a magistrate, right, is that they are somehow magically, inhumanly impartial. But they are human, right? They read the news, they listen to the radio, they get stuck in traffic, and they're just as susceptible as anybody else to getting caught up in a moral panic. The magistrate who initially sentenced Violet Coco to 12 months, when she was handing down her sentence, unconsciously parroted something Don Perrottet had said on TV like two days earlier, okay? And that, she wasn't quoting him, it just like came into her mind and out of her mouth and onto the court record. And now that's like immortalized in the court record. And finally, just to close that loop, all of those things work together in concert to open up more political space for parliamentarians to create more repressive legislation and kick off the cycle again, and we go around again. So what is to be done? I'm taking suggestions. <laughs> but don't worry, I did prepare some earlier. <laughs> so first of all, we've got to get educated. I mean, we don't have to get that education from a university or a textbook. I'm movement trained, other activists gave me these skills and I owe it to them to pass them on to other people. Um, I will train anyone who comes at me, but we need to understand the jargon, we need to understand our options, we need to know our rights, and we need to weaponize bureaucracy. When it comes to the legal system, the sad fact is education equals agency. We need to see the courtroom as just one more front on which we are fighting, not just like an annoying bureaucratic process that you fumble your way through after the action. We will never be better resourced than our opponents, so our only option is to be smarter. Not knowing about the law or not believing the law to be a legitimate source of authority doesn't mean that the law can't hurt you. Know it, learn it, understand it, teach other people, act on it. Exercise your goddamn agency. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it atrophies. That extends to when you're talking to your lawyer. The thing with lawyers is that they are trained to get the best outcome for their client as an individual. The movement in general is not their remit. That doesn't mean that they don't, like, as a person, want the movement to succeed. They very likely do. But the only way that they've been trained to practice law is through this very individualized lens. So go out of your way to find a lawyer that understands that distinction, but also help them understand that distinction. That's not what they're trained to do. We can't expect them to get that, like, straight away. But having said that, always remember that they work for you. They take instructions from you, and if they are not following your instructions, you should probably get the hell out of Dodge and get a new lawyer. They can give you advice, but you are in the driver's seat, so don't piss about, take the wheel. The more you have educated yourself, as I was speaking about before, the better equipped you will be to be firm with your lawyer, should you ever need to. So that's my TED Talk on agency. Now we turn to solidarity which is, I, would, I think, the most important weapon that we have against repression. We need to stop dissing each other. Once more, for the people at the back, we need to stop dissing each other. <laughs> within, within any social movement, there's a spectrum of actor, actors that goes from like the most radical to sort of the most regret, like, more, I'll call it progressive, that end. I am so bored of conversations about which end of that spectrum is more effective, or represents a better strategy, or which one's better than the other one. I would love to see us break apart this whole paradigm that those two approaches are mutually exclusive or even in tension. The progressive end of that spectrum lends a movement as a whole its legitimacy. But legitimacy on its own can be placated, undermined, diluted, and ultimately ignored. The radical end of the spectrum gives the movement as a whole its urgency, but urgency on its own can be isolated, excluded, dehumanized, and ultimately, if current trends continue, imprisoned. We need radicals. We, so first of all, we need to just get over ourselves and accept that both ends of that spectrum are at their most effective in the presence of the other one. And except that we need radicals to expand the horizons of what is possible, but we also need progressive to be implementing whatever is currently possible. Um, 
We are a lot better at doing that for each other when we're doing it on purpose. We do it accidentally sometimes. We manage to line up. But when we're doing it on purpose, we're way better at it. Um, when Blockade Australia got smashed by police, uh, people were literally still in custody while people were like posting hot takes about everything they'd done wrong. Yeah. We gotta stop doing that, man. We gotta stop doing that. That's, that's the moment where moderate, you know, respectable voices need to come into the spotlight and go, actually, they have a point and how you're treating them is not okay. That's, that's like, yeah. If you legitimize the radical end of the spectrum, you are by proxy legitimizing everything that is less radical than that. So it's ultimately gonna, like if you are in a, a organization that wouldn't have necessarily done what those people did, but if you legitimize that, imagine how good you look now, right? Um, and then when we're, when we're doing that for each other consciously, we can work together to drag the Overton window over and we, we actually kind of good cop, bad cop them, in a way, ironically, right? Like, if that, if that works on us, surely it'll work on them. So, when people are getting smashed by repression, back them in. Even if you wouldn't have necessarily done whatever they did. <laughs> Dismantle, thank you. Dismantle the narratives that dehumanize them because the only purpose they serve is to legitimize the use of force against them. And also recognize that repression always starts at the fringes and works its way in. So if they were not out there being more radical than you, then perhaps you would be the most radical thing going, and it would be you copying that repression. Mm. <laughs> Recognize also that if everyone everywhere softened their message to make it more palatable to the political center, then the most progressive thing around would be Labour left. That's dystopian. If that's awful. We need to build strategies that do not require homogeneity of tactics, of messaging, or of organizing cultures to be successful. Our power is and always has been collectively constituted. If you believe in that notion, it follows that preserving the collective and the relationships through which it is manifest is always more important than any individual action or event. No, look, look around you, like in this room, this is the team. No one is coming to save us. The power structures around us can feel that the sun is setting on their empire and we are living through the death rattles of a system that is breaking under its own weight. Even if the people at the top wanted to save us, and I don't believe that they do, they actually don't have the tools. It is us who will invent the tools to, that will solve the problems that are before us. It is us that will build a new world just like we built this one. We have never needed them. That's why they had to make us forget everything that we're capable of. They had to invent permission just to have something to give us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the New South Wales Teachers Federation members are about to take demonstration action outside state Labor MP offices from this week. What do we need to know? Sorry. Uh, uh, well, hang on. Hang on. Just get the. Yep, there we go. Um, you, 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 stop telling people to plead guilty as a as a first impulse. Uh, so what? One of the things that worked against them, at least that is, is that we said to plead not guilty. We had to plead not guilty. It was two years jail. And, and they were going, oh, oh, they were sort of taking the piss out of us. Oh, come on, mate, they're not going to get fucking jail. Like, well, well, it says two years jail, and one of them actually has gone to jail, so we're going to plead not guilty, and we're going to ask for trials. Well, here it is, right? So instead of, after a protest, normally, you know, there's 20 of you arrested, but by, the, by that evening it's dealt with, or the next morning it's dealt with. No, 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 we're going for, you know, 20 hearings and 20 days and big resources. And I think they actually, they realised it, right? So anyway. My point is this, you, you don't have to study the law, you really don't. I mean, there's lawyers, right? Don't study the law, don't waste It's good to do, though. Well, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, well, yes, okay, I agree. But, but study the charge. If that charge has a high end on it, if it's a weird, something strange about it, right? It's got years, it's had years jail, 
way he's played not guilty, which is counterintuitive to what everyone's done for 20 years, because you just want to get your fine and you know, we'll move on. So that's the danger. Now they may or may not apply these new the new, it's only one new one, which is the road one, right? And the Crimes Act. And the Crimes Act. But, but it, it, a whole host of other things they're now sort of uh, accustoming themselves to. You know, they're, oh yeah, we could do that, we could do this, we could do that. But mind you, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they've, they've come through that, they've come through the COVID, uh, the really a sour mood towards the police and those powers. The police themselves don't like it. The police themselves didn't like enforcing the COVID, the anti protest COVID uh, stuff. They didn't like doing the street protests. So it might be as grim as we first feel. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I feel like uh, you were talking about uh, preventing getting arrested in the first place, which is the oh. prelude to Mark's entrance. <laughs> Mark, enter, Mark comes into the picture after someone's been arrested. Um, look, if you put in a Form 1, you're probably going to be fine. Like, if it's just, if it's not, what the police really don't like is actual disruption to business, like, as in stopping work, you know, stopping a coal facility from being able to continue to operate, etc., etc. If you want to have a straight up and down rally outside an MP's office, I would say, like, on the, like, I have a very high, high horse about Form 1s. I think it's ridiculous that you should, the, the idea that you need permission to protest from the very authority that you're protest like. But you don't actually have, like, it's not unlawful to protest without a Form 1. Um, that's a really commonly held misconception. It's, submitting a Form 1 basically just makes it slightly harder for the police to disperse you or to, and it reduces the circumstances under which they can give you a move on direction lawfully. If you put in a Form 1, really unlikely anybody's going to get arrested. The other thing is if it's the Teachers' Federation, and here's where the politicking comes in, when they were introducing these protest laws, obviously all the unions were like, ahem, uh, we get you elected every fucking time, and you're going to turn around and criminalise us? Like, you were, you're a, as a party, you were born out of a protest movement. Like, what the fuck is this? Um, so the, I, my analysis, and this is just my analysis, do with, do with it what you will, is that they are very reluctant to use it against union demonstrations. They're excluded. It's in the legislation. Well, there, there's, yeah, like, there is a carve out for them. So the unions, uh, like, for, so they were passed under the Perrottet government, but in order to get Labor's support to pass them, they have to make a carve out for industrial action. Um, and for like unions and the way that they've worded it there is room like if it's not um, protect, protected action to begin with then it wouldn't the carve out kind of wouldn't apply but I think that they are extremely reluctant to use it against unions because they know that then the unions will act will like unions are already kicking up a stick like shout out to any union comrades in the room who've been involved in like the pushback, the sort of like internal struggle to get Labor to even consider repealing it, the, the men's government. Like that is exactly what they had to promise the unions they wouldn't do to pass it. And so I think it's too soon. The, you know, maybe in 10 years, everyone will have forgotten that we had that conversation and then they'll whip it out. But like, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you're the next person here. Hi, Richard Bold, um, Socialist Alliance, plus quite a few different protest groups, including Drum Rebellion, who regularly protests outside the ALP. And with the Drum Rebellion outside the ALP, that's pretty disruptive. But um, yeah, look, my question really is around the contrast between what Lily's saying and what Mark is saying. To me, as somebody who's been through the courts and still facing another court process, the lawyers treat this as a game, and it is, after all, a game that the lawyers make money out of, one way or the other. I think my lawyers just made money out of the police. I've no idea how much they made out of them, but uh, 
they just made money out of the police because I got off, therefore, uh, and that was uh, very useful. And I appreciate what the lawyers do for us in various ways, including pro bono or low bono, which is always a bit ambiguous. But the point is, it sounds like you're treating it as a game, and we're treating it as life-threatening. Um, it threatens our movement. We do have lots of people who are now arrested who don't want to use the lawyers because the, the way that the lawyers talk to them and what have you, they don't take into account the threat to the movement. And to me, it's just chalk and cheese what Will is saying and what Mark is saying. It's, that's my main point. And I'd just like to say a bit about just reinforcing so many things that Will said. But they are using bail. Police are punishing us. They are ignoring the linkage court. They are punishing us. And we're not getting that opposed as much as it should be. In fact, in most cases, bail should not be applied at all. It's, it's against the bloody law, the way they apply bail. Yeah. Lawyers first. Please give me a break, too. I've busted my ass on these cases. For you to say that really offends me, right? Really offends me. And I got loads of people out of jail that would be in jail because I cared about it. So please uh, leave, leave, leave me out of the uh, of the group um, discussion. I can tell you the real problem is finding a lawyer. This idea that all the lawyers blah, 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 your man. I couldn't get lawyers when there was when there was twenty five people in Surrey Hills having a horrible quality time. I couldn't get any lawyers in Sydney to do it. All of them had this oh they're the radicals, you know they're the oh I hear it was Greenpeace or oh you know whatever. So your problem is not dickhead lawyers. Your problem is getting lawyers. Right? It's, a, it's a real problem. And in terms of every other point, every other point you made, I thoroughly agree with you. And, but don't, 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 um... Turn it on. Hashtag not all lawyers, Mark. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well lawyers, aren't, lawyers aren't magistrates, right? So this is what you've said, which was very, very commonly said, very commonly said. It's actually took me a long time to, uh, okay, what's going on here? Because people are really pissed off about that. As you should be. I'm not justifying it. It's, it's like we, like, I was suggesting I would accept this sort of bail, right? This is outrageous what's happening on bail. But what are you going to do about it? Now, that's really interesting. What are you going to do about it? Oh, we'll take a legal action. There you go. So you call the lawyers, right? Um, uh, so that's one thing, and we have done it, just chipped away those bail applications. If you don't want a lawyer, well, what are you doing? What will happen to you? I don't care. I'm, I've got no, uh, what do you call it, horse in the race, you know? I don't care, but but the people that have self-defended, and you saw it in that first wave, were decimated, decimated. Everyone, in, oh, you know, I know the law, and I, blah, blah, blah. but uh, I don't know what for whatever reason. But just look at it statistically, they were whipped. And and anyway, so the problem is not dickhead lawyers. The problem is finding any lawyers. And and can I say this? A lot of people have law degrees now. A lot of them work as lawyers and have. Good uh, instinct, you know, for constitutional law, something like that. They're probably not the people you want. When, when you're facing the force of police and they're dragging you away and they're putting you in a cage and they're dragging you to a magistrate, it, it, it's not the academic from New South Wales uh, who talks about the constitution that you really need, right? You truly need criminal lawyers. Criminal lawyers are used to getting in there, getting people out. You're right, that's what they do. They get in to get you out. And leave leave everything else to you. That's what I suggest you have as a front line. You have two two sets of as you strategize differently. I strategize differently on your lawyers. You want grunty criminal lawyers used to you know, getting called late at night, turning up the next morning. You're on a release this man. You know you want them to do that, and then you want you do want high end because if you want to challenge those bail laws, what are you going to do? Stand outside the court, change the bail laws? Well, you could. I mean, I would, I would <laughs> as well. Uh, but how, how, how else do you do it? So that's my bit. Thank you. Okay, Bill. Thanks, Richard. Um, 
this is sort of what I tried to touch on in the section of my speech where I talked about sort of having a good relationship with your lawyer. Like you want to, and you want to be in a position where you can have a frank conversation with your lawyer. And if they're not, if you don't feel like they're hearing you, they're like understanding the distinction that you're trying to make. Because I mean, like, notwithstanding all the work that Mark has done for free for the movement, like there are a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of um, experiences that I have had people. So I just for context, I do a role that is often called legal support within the movement. So I support them. I give people a legal briefing before they go to an action where there's a risk of arrest. Um, I look out and then I'm on call while the action's happening. You look out for people's well-being who are in custody or directly dealing with police. And then after the action, you like debrief with everyone after they come out of custody, um, talk to them about like anything that happened that they might not realize was actually a breach of their rights. But like, because you know that legislation well, you, you can be like, oh, you actually like have grounds to make a formal complaint or like, you know, potentially pursue civil action. Blah, blah, blah. So I have had lots of people, like I've supported lots and lots of people through the court process and um, I really, you know, there are common, there are themes that come out like, oh, tell the magistrate you're sorry because um, <laughs> they like remorse, you know, tell them or one that is quite worrying that I've had, um, had a few people sort of seek my opinion about recently is this kind of leaning toward or like pointing toward being like, oh, I wasn't in my right mind when I did it. Like this, yeah, right? Which leans into the exact narrative I was talking about where protest is like a tantrum or like an expression of your feelings rather than like a way of participating in democracy. Um, so I guess I want to give shout outs to um, the Environmental Defenders Office as well. So if it is a climate protest that you are, Arrested at um, the Environmental Defenders Office has a great program called Defending the Defenders, where they give free, and it's free, it's not means tested, it's not anything, uh, representation. Um, there also, I want to say uh, on the issue like about bail, legal aid lawyers, there is often this perception that legal aid is somehow like worse than fancy corporate firms, or like that they're not as good lawyers. No. The lawyers who could have gone and made shitloads of money in the corporate sector and chose to defend people who couldn't afford to pay them. All right? So that's the first thing about legal aid. Second thing about legal aid is because they defend people who can't afford representation, they deal with bail, like, all the time. Like, they're dealing with the, the crimes that and the offences that generally, like, marginalised people are charged with, not, like, embezzlement and stuff, right? So their bread and butter is bail. So if you need a bail variation, like legal aid does them like all day. Like they're in court like all day getting people out, of, like getting people's bail varied. Um, yeah, but basically what it comes down to is you have to have a relationship of trust with your lawyer. Like you do put a lot of trust in them. There's no denying that. Like you have to, and yeah, so if you don't feel comfortable when you talk to your lawyer and you don't feel heard when you tell them your concerns, explore getting a new lawyer. Okay, I'm Joffrey, and good evening, Mark. And I appreciate what both of you just said. Knowledge is power. Our ignorance is their power. Um, I want to call attention to a failure we had back in 2011, the Occupy movement. And I think one of the reasons we missed that golden opportunity was because the desire of certain groups to take the lead and to control the movement. And I think we need to resist such temptations because it turns off the general populace. It discourages people from participating because they don't want to be associated with anyone else except their interests, their concerns. So, how would you respond to that risk I just mentioned? Thank you. 
Thanks for you. Yeah, um, great question. Um, you know, speaking as uh, someone who fucking loves control, um, <laughs> something that is real. That is real work that I have done on myself in the movement to, you know, resist the temptation to want to control everything. And it's really easy to fall into that, right? Like we all care so much about the success or failure of the movement that when you see somebody doing something that you feel like is misguided or it's not going to work or whatever, whatever, you just like, ah, stop, no, like you're not going to work. Yeah, you're yeah. making it worse. You're you're undermining. You're turning people away. You're undermining the cause. You're you know, whatever. None of that, like, I ironically think that telling other people, like, publicly expressing that you think someone else is undermining the cause undermines the cause. Like, it, like it. so I, uh, really great, um, my friend and mentor Zelda likes to say, ask, don't tell. When you see other organizers doing something that you don't think will work, ask them why they think it will work rather than tell them all the reasons that it won't. Asking open space, but telling shuts it down more often than not. Um, you can, yeah. If, if you've really got a problem with something, like, like my line is, will people get hurt? Like, like, is, like, I just, even if I don't like it, I just, like, don't interfere with it. I'm like, maybe somebody else likes that, and they're going to mobilize that section of people. Like, I don't get to police how everybody everywhere talks about any particular issue, well, anything at all. Mm. Um, so rather than, and also, like, we need to recognize that, you know, we, we live now in this kind of, like, media landscape that's, like, super fractured. Like, there's no... No one is actually reaching everyone anymore, right? Like even on like mainstream, like nobody my age watches Channel 7 News. No one. Absolutely nobody. Like we, and more and more people get their news from social media. So it's being passed through the algorithm and what the algorithm thinks you want to know or has decided you want to know for you. Like no one is so, so like, when you see someone talking about an issue using different messaging, bar like it actually being like offensive or like disrespectful to some other group of people, um, the, like a common example is like erasing First Nations struggle from the picture of, and talking about something where you really should have like acknowledged the First Nations resistance going on underpinning that. Like, you know, but in general, like, unless it's up to that point, like, just recognize that they're talking to a different set of people to you, and hopefully they're going to mobilize a different set. Like, work on the assumption that other people know their base at least as well as you know yours. I'll okay. very briefly pick up on that, but also something you said before, Lily. Um, about okay, people attacking each other. Because I, 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 I've straddled a lot of the groups, I see it very uh, evidently. And also, many people have very diverse ideas on what a legal defence should be, so I straddle them as well. But, uh, and and realise you can never satisfy them. So what I do, very much do, is ask that person, right? I think it's a big mistake to go, this is how these cases should be dealt with, right? Big mistake. If someone wants to say mental health, it's up to them. Yeah. Right? Truly, oh. truly. It's, it's a sort of a, you can't impose these things on people. Ask them what they want. Um, and because everyone's got a diverse view. But, but one observation was about how they really are targeting, they're targeting groups like BA. And BA, are, and I just say it broadly, as a good tip because I meant, I've always meant to say it to BA, uh, give some element of what you do a benign um, face. Because if you say, Lockout well, Australia is there to disrupt, we, we, we don't care about the laws, we're there to disrupt, blah, 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 blah. They use, 100% use that in lots of ways, right? The media just grab onto it, politicians, these are the radicals. And, it ha and the courts, unfortunately, whip you for it. You'll go into a courtroom and there'll be three pages, you know, in a five page statement, there'll be three pages about how atrocious, you know, uh, this terrible Lockout okay, Australia, blah, blah. If you, so my suggestion is this, that some part of it, 
Oh, look, if, you, if you're running web pages saying what you are, some part of it says save the koala or, <laughs> we, you know, we plant gum trees on the weekend or something, right? I promise you it makes a difference. Because they're targeting them, and I know this at a very high level, they're, they're chasing bank accounts, for instance, right? And, and one of the bodies that, 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 that uh, collects money, they sort of, I won't name it, but that collects this money, they contacted me, they were being approached. About who, who are the accountant? They were about to seize it. About to, and they saw good, right? And so if they can go into a Supreme Court judge and say, look, here's their aims and objectives, it's to destroy the world, you know, as we know it. Oh, well, of course, we've got to stop them. But if, if, if one of those evil lawyers is in the courtroom and they're able to say, that's not true, you know, she, she, yes, she's BA Australia, but she could well be planting gum trees along the, you know, along the creek. That's her job, that's her primary thing, and it was teaching the kiddies how to uh, have a little bit of diversity in the in the message and we'll save you, ultimately we'll save you. That's a little tip. Thanks. Thank you. A big call to Rachel. Um, yeah, Rachel, also social science um, green left, but um, I wanted to thank both of you, and I think this is a really important forum and discussion because we've suffered in New South Wales, we're the most repressive state of them all, although South Australia now has come into its own Liberal Party uh, MP. Uh, yeah, WA is also punching. But, you know, on the books and in the experience of how many environment activists we've had in jail, really New South Wales takes the cake. And my re I think it's six environment activists now who have been in jail for more than two weeks, so there's, you know, Andy, Sergio, uh, Violet, and so on. So, you know, I think I've been active for 30 years and we, are, we have entered into a really repressive phase, but it's not just Australia, it's the UK and it's um, the UK really set the bar with the bail conditions and Australia is following suit. And I take Richard's point on and I think actually as a movement we've got to think about bail conditions because they first came for the blockade Australia activists and then, went, then they went to the housing and then they went to the trans and so on. It's, it's definitely coming. That being said, the Labor Party is in power state by state and federally except in Tasmania. And that has shifted and opened up the democratic space a bit. We just managed to get away with a six day occupation of 82 Wentworth Park Road Glebe. The cops came in day one and said, you have the right to political protest, which actually technically isn't correct, but we do. <laughs> So, you know, that democratic space, as Lil was saying, we've got to actually flex that muscle. Um, and the housing campaign looks like we've got a bit of space, you know, uh, where to go now and, and so on. But I think for our movement, we do want to win that demand, repeal the right to protest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, win it, win it. Repeal the anti-protest laws. We And we have to also talk about the bail conditions. But I also want to make point that comrades are being strip-searched um, and that is sexual assault. I, it, I experienced it once myself at the hand of Newtown Police Station. That's another element that we've actually got it out. Mm -hmm. These environment protesters, we've got to defend. We have a matter of survival at stake, um, so we've got to defend them like our own and repeal the bail conditions. So I think the union front is a good front to move on next, and it's great to hear the Teachers' Federation are moving. But the other committee that Lil is involved in, who, who you haven't outed, is the Protect the Right to Protest Committee. That means once a month, and um, and we need your help. So thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's called the Protect Protest Alliance, um, and if you represent, uh, there are currently a mixture of like grass, scrappy grassroots groups, larger NGOs, and unions. Um, that we all kind of just communicate and keep each other in, in the loop about what we're doing in our kind of respective spaces to try and expand, yeah, political space. Um, oh my God, I had something else to say. Um, UK. UK. Oh, about, yeah, the bail, the bail conditions. Um, I just wanted to make the point that so part of the thing that we're, that we're trying to achieve with the bail, right, is be, so you can, 
if you're if you're given bail conditions, you're released on bail, and you have these ridiculous conditions, you can apply for something that's called a bail variation hearing, where you go before a magistrate and you say, Your Honor, your your lawyer says, you know, Your Honor, this is you know disproportionate, this is ridiculous, given what I did, blah blah blah, and then most of the time, I in my data set, like people succeed. That's part of the problem in a sense because you need to fail in the local court to appeal it up to the district court to then set a precedent that binds all other local court magistrates. So we keep winning <laughs> in the local court and never getting to appeal it. So winning in the local court is good like because now that person is at least freed up and like not under these horrific bail conditions, but every individual person needs to keep going and doing that and being in this court process and like you've got to wait for a day and because the court system is backed up for like ever and ever, like you know people end up being on bail for such a long time like such a long time um yeah so if you find yourself yeah and um like as Rach was talking about, like sort of the first they came for Blockade Australia, we are seeing um, this the the non-association conditions in particular. So when they tell you you can't speak to another person, um, they've tried on ridiculously vague things. Like they've tried to say you can't speak to any other protesters. <laughs> what? How am I supposed to know if my chemist is a protester on the weekend? Like, that's, it's like unenforceable, but that gets thrown out by a magistrate because the magistrate is like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, right, the cops write them. The cops come up with things to try on. <laughs> and then you put it in front of a magistrate and the magistrate says, that means nothing in law. Like, unless you get a real psycho one, which they are out there. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And then finally, uh, the last thing I just wanted to give a shout out to as um, Rachel was kind of listing off different states, um, Disrupt Burrup Hub really need our solidarity at the moment um, over in WA. Uh, they've just been, they're getting like the same stuff that happened to Blockade Australia where the conservative, like, you know, su supposedly pro-climate but like not radical NGOs are like, this is not an acceptable way to protest. Stop it. Um, <laughs> like, that's that's how I read their tweets in my head. Um, so, like, Disrupt Bar Pub really need people going into bat for them right now. So they were um, arrested on their way, like, that they were they went to the home of the CEO of Woodside. Now, all they were going to do was spray paint the fence and then leave. And the media is reporting it like they were going to fucking burn her house down. She's like, I feared for my life and I thank the WA police force for protecting me and my home. Like, they're making it sound like they were going to fucking kill her and all they were going to do is paint on her fence and then leave. And this narrative, again, see it? The conflation of inconvenience and disobedience with violence. They are making it sound like that she was like intimidated and shouted out and endangered exactly like like she was actually in danger um and the other person who needs our solidarity is uh if you look up the bob brown foundation online um her name escapes me right now which is awful but there's a woman who is currently in custody in jail serving a sentence uh, for protecting forests down in tasmania and there are uh, details on the bob brown foundation website uh for how you can write to her um, so I encourage everyone to do that and tell her that she's a legend. Legend. Thank you very much, Lily and uh, Mark. I want you all to give them a round of applause. For that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.